Also ja, mein Name ist Christine Chemnitz, ich leite das Agrarreferat hier in der Stiftung und ähm, ich freue mich natürlich sehr über die warmen Worte von Barbara und ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie alle hier sind heute, um diesen Tag mit uns zu begehen. Meine Aufgabe ist es, ähm, Sie durch den Vormittag zu führen und ähm, wir haben drei ganz, ganz spannende Redner gewinnen können für diesen Morgen. Ähm, wir haben uns den Ablauf so überlegt, dass wir erst alle drei Präsentationen ähm, vorgestellt bekommen und danach ausreichend Zeit oder wahrscheinlich so richtig ausreichend tut die Zeit ja nie, aber viel Zeit zur Diskussion und Fragen haben mit Ihnen. Ähm, und ich will jetzt auch gleich übergeben an Pablo Titonell den wir gewinnen konnten für den Eröffnungsvortrag. Pablo ist leitender Professor der Forschungsgruppe Farming Systems Ecology an der Universität Warningen. Er hat eine Professur in Montpellier. Er hat eine Professur an der äh, Lomas de Zamora Universität in Buenos Aires. Und ich muss ganz ehrlich sagen, ich bin immer wieder beeindruckt, wenn ich solche Lebensläufe lese. Er ist Agrarwissenschaftler und hat sowohl in der Privatwirtschaft gearbeitet, als auch in akademischen Forschungseinrichtungen. Er hat promoviert zu den Themen Produktionsökologie und Ressourcenschutz. Und seine Fachexpertise ist vor allen Dingen Bodenfruchtbarkeit, Farming Systems Analysis und Agrarökologie. Er nimmt an einer Vielzahl von Forschungsprojekten teil, die speziell auf die Widerstandsfähigkeit und die Anpassung von kleinbäuerlichen Betriebssystemen an den Klimawandel fokussieren. Pablo war unter anderem auch einer der wichtigen Redner des FAO-Symposiums zur Agrarökologie. Das ist der Grund oder war der Auslöser, warum wir ihn eingeladen haben. Und wir freuen uns ganz besonders, dass er heute hier ist. Welcome, Pablo, and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> To make sure that I understood what you said. Good morning, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I have to do this in English uh, or in Spanish, if you if you prefer. <laughs> yeah, in English. Um, uh, the title I was invited to 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 present today was this one: huh? Agroecology between climate change adaptation, biodiversity, and food security. What I'm going to do is actually turn it a little bit around. I'm going to start from food security, then biodiversity, and then climate change adaptation, if you don't mind. And what I'm um, prepared is actually a scientific perspective. Where I, I concentrated not on, on, mostly not on political issues or, or, or on, on commercial issues or, or other things, aspects of agroecology or social issues, but mostly from the scientific, and when it is social, also from a scientific perspective, because I'm coming from the academia. And I think it's, it could be a good contribution for the debate today. So what's, what's, known, what's known in science of all, about all these things, the relation between agroecology, climate, biodiversity, and food security? So we had a very good introductory speech. We heard 800 million people who go hungry every year. And we know all these numbers. We know that there is a big disparity in terms of these numbers of hungry people in the world. And when we say 800 people going hungry every year, this figure includes people who are hungry for more than six months a year. If you're hungry for five months a year, you're not part of this, right? So this is an underestimation of what, how big the problem is. Now, on the other hand, we see another trend in the world, which is that we are climbing the trophic ladder. You know, we have these trophic pyramids, and we're going up and up and up. This graph here shows. Can, can I use one of these? Hello? So this graph here shows um, the average position uh, from zero to five. Five is the top of the pyramid, and zero is the bottom of the pyramid. And this is the average for the world. For the world, in the last 50 years, we've been increasing our position in the trophic ladder. Now, this is largely explained by the increase in China and India in the last 20, 30 years, right? But now, if we take the world without China and India, of course, the average would be higher. Right? So we should not only look at what China and India are doing, but also what we are doing, right? especially in Argentina, where we eat quite some meat. Now, one of the problems related to meat consumption is obesity. Not only to meat consumption, to consumption patterns in general. Right? When we look at maps of hunger in the world, and we contrast them with this, they look like a negative image. 
countries that suffer, and, but there are also countries that suffer what we call the double burden of nutrition. They're suffering both problems of malnutrition by defect and by excess, right? Nowadays, obesity kills more people than hunger in the world. 65% of the people in the world live in places where obesity kills more people than hunger. Right? So it's also a problem. When we talk about world food problems, it's not only hunger. Hunger is the, mo the worst moral problem we're facing, but obesity is a major problem. Another problem related to scarcity of foods is volatility in prices of foods. Right? And we know that every time there is a peak in the price of food, there is a riot, there is social unrest. The most, example, the most conspicuous example is the, the Arab Spring right, in 2011. We know that we produce a lot of food and a lot of it is also wasted. Right? 30 to 50% of the food we produce will never reach a human stomach. Right? If we take the case of India, as in this picture, and if we take the case of wheat only, India wastes 21 million tons of wheat. Right? This is twice the production of wheat in the whole of Argentina. Right? It's four times the production of wheat in Spain. It's 20 times the production of wheat in the Netherlands. It's a lot of wheat which is just wasted because of poor storage conditions. Right? The technology to avoid this is there. We don't need any rocket science here. It's just dryers and silos. We know that although we made a lot of progress raising productivity worldwide, we also created a big gap in terms of productivity between regions, right? So in many places of the world, productivity and productivity per capita is still at the same level as in the 60s, right? The technologies that worked in some parts of the world to raise productivity, they didn't work there, both for ecological reasons but also for social reasons. Now, another problem we're facing, and this, this is a figure that comes from the, from the EU, but it's also happening everywhere, also in smallholder family agriculture, is that farmers are getting old. The average age of the farmer is getting old, right? It's in, in the US, for instance, it's reaching about 60 years old. In the Netherlands, it's above 55 already, right? Many farmers are there and their children are not taking over. Farming is not attractive to the younger generations, right? So who's going to produce our food in the future? And the other problem we have relates to the food chain in general. This is an example from the Netherlands that shows, in a, in a very interesting graphical way, they show the total number of farmers right, connected through a number of manufacturers, a number of distributors, a number of um, trading companies that trade uh, the whole production of these farmers through five channels, channels only, to about 17 supermarkets, and they cater for 17 million consumers, right? So actually, it's only five trading companies that decide, that make the link between all these farmers and all these consumers, right? A, and this is, a, well, it could be an advantage, right? but it's, a, it's something that we need to consider. So with all these things in mind, then we can start talking about food security. And I'm going to take over from some of the figures that, that Barbara was, was giving us this morning. Who's producing our food? 97% of the farms in the world are smallholder farms, are smaller than two hectares, right? There's about 500 million households, and perhaps half of them are in Asia, in China, right? 70% of the active farmers are women. So farming is actually mostly a female activity. They produce about 50% of the world consumed by humans, and they do that farming on 20% of the land. 50% of the food consumed produced on only 20% of the land seems to me like a very efficient system. And the world, we know, produces enough calories to feed everyone. We're producing enough calories. If we only consider calories, we're producing enough. Now, what's the problem? Why do we are we enabled to deliver food to the system, for the food system? Well, look at this picture. This picture is a map that shows in green, in shades of green, the number of people that you could feed per hectare if you assume that everyone needs this. So it's a little bit above the requirements. Imagine that you, you plus a pet and plus some waste, that's what you need per day. And so the green areas, the most productive areas of the world, can feed up to 10 people per hectare. Right? But now, 
This is the actual figure. This is how many people are actually being fed with one hectare of production from all these areas. And what we see there is that many of the places that before looked dark green, in this actual picture, they don't. They're only feeding about two to three people per hectare. And why is that? Well, because the food produced in many places is not used to feed people, right? It's used to feed livestock. And although livestock is already counted in the, in, in the green part, in the, in the fraction that is delivered to the, to the system, there are losses in that transformation. And on the other hand, food is also used for many other things in the industry or for biofuels, et cetera, et cetera. So when we actually account for that, here what we see is the fraction of food that is, the fraction of total food produced that is actually delivered to the food system, right? All the areas in red are areas where only 30, 10 to 30% of the food produced is delivered to the system, to the food system, right? And then comes the waste and everything else. Now, that's why the discord that you know, says, well, we need to increase production in highly productive areas to feed the world, well, actually, it doesn't mean, really make a lot of sense. I mean, if you, you can, one of the highest productivity areas in the world for cereals is the corn belts, the American corn belts, right? So you can have really high meals, maize yields, for instance. And one of the poorest regions in the world is rural Malawi, right? Where people use maize for their, for their diet. So if we want to produce maize in the States and ship it to Malawi, actually, in between this and this, there are many other demands for that maize. They're going to have priority. So, this is to say we, we should not privatize solving food security. Food security should be not in private hands. If you leave this problem to the markets, not because they have bad intentions, but just because it's easier to deliver to the industry of ice creams than to deliver to a rural family in Malawi, right? It's more attractive, it's easier, it's closer, it's, it pays better, etc., etc. It's logistically easier. So we should take responsibility to make sure that people get food in those situations. That means that when we, think, when we say, well, we need to increase production in the world, I'll say yes, but not everywhere and not at any cost. We have to increase production in these situations. And what is the model that we need to increase production in those situations? And what has to increase? What kind of food needs to be produced? Those are questions that we need to answer. So when we talk about food security, we don't talk only about availability of food, how much is produced, agricultural production is only part of the picture. It's also about access, stability, and utilization of that food. And it is also about nutritional diversity. Right? It's not about calories only. So there was this, this work done by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation where they say, well, let's imagine, let's just calculate what would be the ideal diet to keep everyone healthy. What would be the ideal diet? And say, well, an ideal diet should have a number of things, right? And so when we look at what the world produces with respect to what we need for an ideal diet, what we need is here. Huh? It's uh, the 100%, right? So what we see is that, for instance, when we consider whole grains, actually we're producing more, 50% more than what we need, right? When we consider vegetables, we're not producing enough. We need to increase vegetable production, right? When we're talking about nuts, seeds, and fruits, we really have to increase a lot the production of these elements, right? By 50% almost. And of course, nuts, seeds, fruits are tree crops. Can you imagine the amount of hectares of trees that you would need to plant to be able to produce all that? Well, perhaps you could do it through agroforestry, bringing together arable land and forestry, right? trees on the landscape. Milk. My Dutch farmers are really very happy every time I say this. Yeah? <laughs> so, well, yes. But actually, it's not a, I mean, milk has 97% water. It's not a good idea to produce milk here and transport it all over the world, right? You'd be transporting water. So, indeed, we need to find ways of producing fresh milk where people need it, right? Or find substitutes for milk, like almond milk or other things. And so there are systems, there are interesting intensive systems, agroecological systems that work in conditions like this. Like for instance, it's a case in central Kenya. And then fish, this will deserve a whole presentation, so I'm not going to go into, into this. We're producing enough, but we are overfishing. And then the winner of this morning, 
is red meats. Eh? We are producing 500% more than what we need for a healthy diet. 500% more, right? And I'm not going to go into this because Professor Walter Peng is going to explain this very well, but these are the, some of the consequences of increasing meat consumption, especially red meats, right? So this is deforestation. This is a picture that comes from the Chaco Forest in South America, which is not as sexy and attractive like the Amazon, but it's the one that's been deforested at the fastest rate, right? And of course, this has enormous consequences for both society, people who live there, but also for nature, right? And it has consequences also because these soils are marginal. You know, these soils were not cultivated for a reason. Now they're being put into cultivation because the prices are good for the, for the soybean, right? And all the carbon that was stored in those soils and in that vegetation is now in the atmosphere, released to the atmosphere, contributing to global warming. So 25% of the emissions come from agriculture or from deforestation for agriculture, more than transport. So how do we use biodiversity to go to propose an alternative to this? I'm not, I'm not going to talk about biodiversity in the sense of conservation, but how do we use biodiversity to actually produce food? Now, biodiversity, we look at the forest, and in the forest we can imagine all kinds of, of species, animal and plant species living there. But if we also look at the soils, in those soils we find a lot of diversity. And these are, this is a graph that shows what we call a trophic network in the soil. This is something that can be done with DNA mapping techniques. You can map the DNA of the organisms that live in the soil, so you know who is there. It's like their identity card. So you know who's there, you know which functional groups are there, and you know how they relate to each other. Right? It's very important information. Now, when we look at the grasslands, you see already there's a little bit less diversity, a little bit less smaller bubbles, and also less connections between those, those organisms. And when we look at the agricultural fields, we see the degradation in that diversity. Nowadays, we know that the Diversity in the strength and the nature of these networks has a lot to do with the efficiency of nutrient use, of nutrient release to plants, and also nutrient capture, right? These systems are not only having less nutrients, but also are more leaky. And any nutrient, even as a fertilizer, will leak faster through this system than through this, this, this system, right? So this is an important element of biodiversity that we, don't, we can't see. But now, thanks to new lab techniques, we can actually identify very well. And we know that certain ways of farming, like organic farming, have an important influence on those networks in the soil. Now, another element of diversity which is important in farming is arthropods in general, insects, beneficial insects. They are helping us. They are helping us controlling pests. They're, they act as natural enemies, natural control enemies. They act as pollinators, right? But when we design, we need to design landscapes that actually create habitats for them, right? If we want to have those pollinators, if we want to have those natural enemies, we need to also provide them with, an, with the habitats, right? I mean, that means that when we look at the landscape like this, this is a map of a landscape with different types of land uses. It's a mosaic. Actually, we should look at the landscape in the way they would look at the landscape, right? So for, for a, a pollinator that needs nectar, this landscape looks like a desert, right? For um, somebody who needs to eat aphids, well, it's, it's like a feast, actually. Uh, there's lots of aphids in that landscape, etc. So it, this is important, uh, and it's important for us to actually design landscapes in a way that we can host this diversity, right? And we're talking about 120 million billion euros per year when it comes to accounting for the benefits of pollination alone. Right? So it's big business. We're not talking about penis here. This is another way of looking at how we can create habitats for favorable habitats. For instance, in this particular case, what we have is a map that shows uh, the density of trees in the landscape. And this is the level of parasitism. Parasitism means that this wasp is going to lay the eggs within this caterpillar. And the caterpillar is going to die. But well, it will not eat our, our crop. So if we want to control this caterpillar using this wasp, what we see is that this parasitism is very strong near the forest. But it's almost nil when you move away from the forest. 
That means that from the perspective of biological control with this wasp uh, for this caterpillar, this is not a good landscape design, right? Because here we don't have any control, right? So with this information, we can start engineering our landscapes in order to have more effective biological control, right? But of course, this is very data intensive, time intensive. It requires a lot of effort and a lot of scientific knowledge. Here is, for instance, an area in the Netherlands, a polder, where what we have here, each dot there, is a semi-natural element. It's not natural because it's a polder, right? It used to be the sea before, but it's a semi-natural element in the landscape, like a little bit of forest or something like that, or a hetero. And for each of those points, the, it's a database, and we, we know exactly which species are there, but we also know not only the names of those species, but also their functional properties. For instance, you know, if we, if we want to have a, a little insect that's going to parasite our pest, right? Now, that insect also needs to feed itself, right? so it needs flowers. And if you, if you have a long nose, then you can eat from any flower, but if you have a short nose, certain flowers don't work for you, right? So that means that we need to have the right flower at the right time to have the right insects. Yeah? So it's really complicated. It calls for a lot of effort in science, a lot of innovation, but it's possible. It's only that it's difficult. It's difficult, but it's interesting, of course. And the most difficult part is not this. Actually, it's not. We can engineer the landscape. We, can, we know a lot about the ecology of these insects, of these flowers, etc. The most important, the most difficult part of it is the human factor, right? Because when we say, well, we're going to design a farm, we only have to deal with one farmer. But if we want to design a landscape, we need to deal with a community. And many of them are farmers, and many of them are not farmers, right? But they have a stake on the community. So for instance, in this case, also in the Netherlands, where we said, well, it would be good to increase the number of hedgerows there, because that will give more ecological cohesion to the landscape for these natural enemies. Actually, some people were not very happy, and they said, no, I mean, I like to see the church of town from my, from my house. You know, I don't want this, or I need to drive a tractor no more because you put a hedgerow there or whatever. So you need to get all the actors of the landscape there and actually get them to negotiate, right, to prioritize objectives. And one tool that can be used to support this negotiation between stakeholders, the government, the farmers, the citizens, is models, right? But not necessarily, you know, simulation models. It can also be models that people model themselves, right? They model the landscapes. But of course, you can also use mathematical simulation models to, to bring some numbers to the discussion. Now, let me go to the last part of, of the presentation that relates to climate change adaptation. There are many other examples, as you can imagine, in which you can use biodiversity to make a more efficient way of farming. Yeah? Plenty. Next time you can invite me to just talk about that. I'd be happy. But when, you, when we think about climate change adaptation, I think it's pretty obvious, even if you're not an ecologist, even if you're not an agronomist, it's pretty obvious that the ability of a system like this to adapt is different than the ability of a system like this to adapt, right? And these systems were designed thinking about how many people you can feed per hectare. Whereas here we think about how many people can make a living out of a hectare, which is a different thing, right? And in these systems, we have different species, we have nutritional diversity, right? remember the, the ideal diet that I was discussing before. Right? We have interactions, perhaps a dry year we have a problem with one of the crops, but other one does better. Uh, if you have pests and diseases, there are also lots of natural enemies there to control this. Right? So this is, these are completely different models, and the science necessary to deal with these completely different models is also different, I would say. Now, what we did is to collect a lot of publications from the literature, and we did a, a meta-analysis of, of those publications, comparing the ability of these two types of systems to adapt to climate change events, right, or to mitigate climate change. So we actually did a review of 97 published references scientific literature. And in those 97, from analyzing those 97, we actually found that organic and agroecological farming systems 
perform better in carbon sequestration up to 30 centimeters, energy use efficiency, soil water holding capacity, resilience to drought, and resilience to hurricanes and heavy rainfall. And we didn't have any conclusive difference in terms of global warming potential, CO2 equivalents, or carbon sequestration to one meter, and that's mostly because of lack of data. Lack, and there were not enough publications on that. Right? Now, a couple of years ago, we had these publications that were also referred to this morning that were showing the yield gap between conventional and organic farming, right? And one was produced in Wageningen, and the other one was done in the, in the US and in Canada. They were done in parallel. They were not talking to each other, and they came out with the same results. They say, well, the average productivity gap between organic farming and conventional farming is about 20%. 20, 25%, but it depends on what species are you considering, et cetera, et cetera, right? So how do you read this graph? Well, basically, if there is no difference, you're in one, right? If you're in 0, 0,8, that means that organic yields 80% of conventional, right? So it's 20% less. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's interesting. that was interesting to me. I, I actually was surprised. I thought it was bigger, the difference. So I asked for the data, and I started looking at it in detail to see whether there were ranges of difference. That's something that Marita was also pointing to. And actually not. I mean, it was 20% all over. You know? What is interesting here is that when you look at here, we have the plot of conventional yields, and here, organic yields. And you see, and these are the quartiles. So actually, 50% of the yields under conventional were already below five tons, right? People often assume that conventional is always highly productive, but these are, you know, for instance, here we have a yield conventional management that means with fertilizer, with pesticides and everything else, and it's below two tons per hectare. It's really not much, right? Okay, so last year we had this other paper in which they did a very good job published in the Royal Society, published in Proceedings, which is also a very prestigious journal. And what they did is they reanalyzed all those data properly, because what I did here was just a, a, a quick uh, back of the envelope check, but they actually did it very, very well in the sense that they accounted for the different sources of variance. I mean, it's a, it's a bit difficult to explain. For those of you who are interested, I'd recommend to read this paper. And well, they recalculated those gaps and they say, well, actually it's not 20%, it's 10%, but whatever, 10, 20, is, isn't much of a difference. And these are all experimental fields. But one thing that they did, which is interesting, is they look, let's look at the gaps per type of management, right? So for instance, if we think in terms of nitrogen, they say, well, Let's compare cases in which the total amount of nitrogen applied was the same in organic and in conventional. Now, when the total amount of nitrogen fertilizer was the same, then the gap was 10% or less than 10% was 9%, right? When the more nitrogen was used in conventional, ah, no, then yes, it's 30% difference. But it's because they're also using more nitrogen. Right? And so on. So they really went in more in detail to understand this variation. Now, my question beyond all this, this statistical analysis is always, well, OK, the gap is 10%, 20%, I don't know. But what's the gap in terms of the investments? How much money goes for research under conventional farming? And how much money goes into research for organic farming or for agroecology? What's your guess? What's the gap there? 90 to 10, something like that, right? Well, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I wish somebody was able to do this study, and uh, I, I didn't have time to do it properly, but some examples. The Dutch government that, in, that invests quite some money in organic farming invests about 4 million euros per year, right? And a company like Monsanto invests 980, right, for conventional. And the Dutch government, this is about 5% about of the total investment, so the rest goes also to conventional farming, right? So this yield gap between both models of agriculture is also a research gap. Right? We haven't done, most of the knowledge we have for organic farming comes from farmers themselves. Right? And we scientists, we're always behind. Now, of course, those analyses are interesting, but they're, are interesting, but they're quite anecdotic because 
The problem with those analyses is that they are coming from different situations, always, always from control conditions, always from experiments managed by scientists, so you can doubt that. But the problem is that they're also coming from one-year data, right? And when we look at the impact of different forms of agriculture, especially the impact of agroecology or organic farming, it's actually a long-term impact, right? And this is um, an experiment in the University of California in Davis. It's a 100-year experiment that started in 1993. And they have different things. They're comparing different systems, organic among others. And what they show there is th something like this. You know? And this is, to me, more interesting than looking at, at the points. Because look, these are the yields of tomato, in this case, or something like that, you know? under three under three different management systems, right? So what you see here is that if you would have done your experiments only in 94, your conclusion would be that green is better than blue and blue is better than red, right? But if you would have done your experiment in 95, only in 95, then you would have said, okay, red is better than green and green is better than blue. If you would have done your experiment only in 96, you would say there is no difference. Right? So that's why it's important to have a long-term data. Huh? Because now, when you look at, at these three treatments, which one is the more stable over time? The red one, right? Organic, in this case. It's more stable. And this is not so only found here in California. The, the other advantage of having these long-term trials is that we can also look at the evolution of soil life over those, those 20 or 30 years. But also in Pennsylvania, in the famous Rodale Institute trials already for 30 years, I think, and they see the same thing. And what they see basically is that, you know, every time there is a dry year, organic does better than conventional. And this is not magic. This is just more organic matter in the soil, right? And of course, there are many other advantages related to organic and conventional and among those, also the energy inputs and the greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Now, all of this is compiled in this report, which is a little bit outdated already. It's from 2009, but very useful, because it actually summarizes a number of international long-term trials. One of them here in Germany, from Switzerland, from the US, and they look at all those climate variables. Right? So this is really very conclusive scientific evidence. What happens in another context? What happens in the African context? What happens when we have tropical climates and sandy soils, degraded soils? You know that 25% of the soils in the world are degraded, right? And we hear often people saying, well, the solution for Africa is fertilizers. Just give fertilizers to people. With fertilizers, that's the more, more main limiting factor. Well, we try to restore the productivity of this soil with fertilizers, and the first year, we applied 100 kilos of nitrogen, something that farmers would rarely do in those circumstances because they can't afford them. And 100 kilos of nitrogen plus 30 kilos of phosphorus and nitrogen plus animal manure, right? And, well, of course, with animal manure, with phosphorus, the yields were better, but you see, they were still below one ton per hectare. It's really very poor. So we're asking farmers to invest in something very expensive, like fertilizers, for them it's expensive, and the yields are still below one, one two. But okay, we're starting from a degraded soil, right? So we want to build up the fertility of these soils. So the second year, we had better results, right? And the third year, we had a year in which the rainfall was not, it was not really a dry year, but there was a drought during a certain period of the crop flowering. And what happened then? Well, then the treatments that received only fertilizers, they did not perform, right? So when we talk about climate change adaptation, we need to think of how are we going to deal with organic matter in the soil. And what I'm saying here is nothing new. It's actually 150 years old, right? It was already said by somebody who you may know, the Baron Justus von Liebig, who, you know who this person was? Yeah. Huh? Somehow, he was the, he invented bouillons. Huh? He made, actually he made his living out of this. But he was also a bright mind. Huh? He is the person who actually in 1840 published this 
this report, this scientific treaty, in which he said, look, when you apply animal manure to a crop, what does the trick is not the manure itself, it's the nutrients inside there. So we can actually isolate those nutrients, make a solution, and apply it to crops, and they will grow. And he showed that. So he created fertilizers, right? And of course, the, the fertilizer industry has him as the father of the fertilizer industry, the father of modern agriculture. But you know, a few years later, 20 years later actually, people say that when you become older you become greener, right? <laughs> he wrote this other treaty. That's what they say. So there, you know. is hope. there is hope, there is hope. Just wait for me. You know, he said something like this. Adding chemical mix, he wouldn't call them fertilizers yet, he would say adding chemical mixtures to soils without organic matter has in the long term, yeah, he was not very politically correct, huh? <laughs> the same effect that alcohol, he said brandy, has on uneducated people, inefficiencies. Hmm? He said laziness. Yeah? So he said that, but unfortunately, this report was hidden. Huh? Nobody knows it. No, nobody teaches this in, in a school at universities, right? We all learn about this one. Now, this is all, all this piece to say, well, why do we need agroecology? Huh? And what's agroecology? If, 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 in case you, you may, may not know, it's the application of ecological concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable food systems, right? Agroecology works it doesn't work through standards. It's not a set of practices, right? It's a, these are principles. Principles, concepts and principles. Principles like diversity, resource use efficiency, recycling, natural regulation, synergies, right? Those are the principles. And then, as Barbara was saying this morning, it's, it depends where you are, it depends on the context, which technologies are going to, to be in place to actually fulfill these principles, right? So there's no recipes here. It's just principles. And there's also no certification standard. So farmers can transition towards agroecology without the need to, you know, and sometimes if they still have to apply a fertilizer or, well, they can do it. I mean, it's, 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 it's open. It's, uh, it's not meant to be a commercial strategy, right? It's meant to be a different way of farming. And it has a lot in common, if you want, with another movement that comes from industrial design, from architecture, which is the cradle-to-cradle -cradle movement, especially with this idea that waste is food, right? Because in nature, everything is food, right? In nature, there's no waste. Waste is just a human invention, right? So when we say, can agroecology work for climate change, for climate, you know, and well, for that, I, I searched for an example, which is the driest I could find. You know? These places in the coastal area of Peru and Chile, you, know, you go there, you ask farmers, how much does it rain here? And they say, it doesn't rain here. You know, it's, it's just a desert. And with a little water farmers can get from, from streams, from, from seasonal streams, they, some of these farmers can create this oasis, uh, combining trees and crops and also livestock not cows necessarily, and with the refusals and with the waste of this livestock, they can produce compost, they can produce biogas, and the refusals and the waste of all this can be used to fertilize the soils and actually improve soil biology beyond the average, beyond uh, what you would expect in such a dry climate. Right? Now, all this knowledge is not provided by by governments, by companies, by international organizations, is knowledge that moves from mouth to mouth, from farmer to farmer, from campesino to campesino. So that's why we said that the social movement is a very important component of agroecology. Right? The social organization, the social movement, is the medium on which agroecology spreads. Right? So it's an important, we cannot, we cannot dissociate both. Right? It's very important. Look at the example of Brazil. In Brazil, we have plenty of examples of agroecological production, of landscape restoration. This farmer, he, are you going to write five minutes or two? Two. 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 All right, <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the right track. These farmers are not only you know, restoring the landscapes and making a living for themselves, that this farmer is growing coffee, organic coffee, etc. but he's also actually delivering an ecosystem service for all of us. 
he's helping all of us cool down the climate. Right? Brazil is one of the few countries that, that actually reached two of the millennium goals of reducing extreme poverty and ending up with hunger. Right? So we need to learn from Brazil. If we, we think about feeding the world, let's learn from the examples that worked. So one of the, the elements that, that were in place was the policies under the program Zero Hunger. And there were 60 different policies, policy mechanisms within that program. And they deployed those mechanisms differently because Brazil is very heterogeneous, just like the world, just like Africa, just like anywhere where we need to solve this problem. And they came up with a national policy on agroecology. This is the first country that has a national policy on agroecology. Right? So I think we need to learn from these examples. And as I said before, of course, agroecology is, it originated from social movements, from campesino movements. It's um, and the best model, in my view, for solving the world hunger problem because it can, it can help people to produce food in those places where they cannot afford other technologies, where other technologies don't work, where they, they can also be sovereign. We have, have you know, this feeling of sovereignty of what, of what they eat. But we also have another responsibility. When we look at the number of smallholder farms in the world, we said we're talking about 20% of the land. The other 80% of the land is managed by small or large-scale farmers. Right? And so the major environmental impact of agriculture on the environment comes from large-scale farming. So I think it would be a very good idea to use principles of agroecology to design more sustainable farming, even when we're talking about large-scale commercial farming, like in this case, in this picture here, a farm of 3,000 hectares farming with these methods, right? Mechanized, high-tech, et cetera, et cetera. There are many high-tech solutions to actually reduce the need for pesticides, like nanotechnology sensors and things like those. So we can use that, that knowledge, all that technology, to actually put it at the service of more sustainable farming, not only for smallholders, but also for large-scale farming. Right? from an environmental impact perspective. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I think I finished on, right on time. Thank you very much.